You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 30, sonnet 29. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if, if I, I say I'm not, not just another enough. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if, if I, I say I will never, never surrender? We all know William Shakespeare from his plays, but relatively few people know much about his sonnets which is sad because it was the only writing that he ever published, and its contents form the backbone for the rest of his magnificent body of work. If you're just hearing this podcast for the first time, welcome. While you could start this podcast at any episode, I warmly recommend checking out episode one to get up to speed on the background and framing. Well, it certainly feels good to be doing this again. For all my Spotify listeners, my apologies for any confusion but I only discovered this past week that there have been a few episodes missing from the platform due to bad date formatting. This has since been corrected and everything should now be listed correctly. In graphic novel news, I'm pleased to announce that we're finally starting to work on page 5. To my patrons, I could never fully express my gratitude for your generosity and your patience, and for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. You play a crucial role in making this work, so thank you, thank you and thank you again. Sonnet 29. In Sonnet 29, Shakespeare and his sonnet profess their love for one another, just as we can imagine Narcissus and his reflection would have. Before I read the sonnet, I must note that while Sonnet 27 begins with a W, Sonnets 29 and 30 begin with a VV. Once again, I don't believe that there are any mistakes in the 1609 quarto edition, so I suspect that there's a reason for this distinction. If I may be so bold as to hazard a guess, W is called double V in French, so we can see that in the English letter W the two Vs are indistinguishable. This suggests that what we might be looking at is an indication that the initial W is here separating into individual Vs, representing William Shakespeare and his sonnet reflection. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, Haply I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 29. When in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries, and look upon myself and curse my fate. Disgrace in Shakespeare's day held a number of meanings, including disfigure or deprive of grace, put out of favor or dismiss with discredit, as well as bring shame or reproach upon. Fortune here is capitalized. In a brief search, I was unable to find a useful reference from Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, but there are only two appearances of this word capitalized in the sonnet sequence, and that's here and in Sonnet 37, a sonnet which explicitly discusses redirecting his love for his lost child into the sonnet sequence in order to no longer be despised, a word that appears later on in this sonnet. Mens, as written in the original text, is Latin for mind, and if that is what was intended, then sounding out men's eyes in Latin would translate to bronze mind, with bronze in Middle English being used for bells, cannons, statues, and fine mechanical works. This may be a stretch, but it does tie in nicely with the outcast of the following line, and fine mechanical works is a wonderful metaphor for the sonnets. Eyes, as has been discussed before, refers to the eyes of Narcissus and his reflection, and the sonnet windows into Shakespeare's soul. Men's eyes, if read as English, 
are distinct from women's eyes. In his plays, Shakespeare often makes fun of men who read sonnets, as sonnets are, at least according to the characters in his plays, the exclusive domain of women and weak-minded men. The word alone is a lot more interesting than I expected, as its origin is the contraction of all one. With this understanding of all alone in mind, Shakespeare and his sonnets, and each sonnet and the rest of the sequence, and Shakespeare and the sonnets and the reader, are all one, each separate but all together. This recalls the three closing lines of Sonnet 8. Who all in one one pleasing note do sing, whose speechless song, being many, seeming one, sings this to thee, thou single wilt prove none. Beweep meant to weep over. Outcast, as mentioned earlier, is hyphenated in the original text. Outcast means much the same today as it did back then, and in Shakespeare's case appears to be referring to his son's death, leaving him outside of society and without the respect his society would give to men's ability to confer inheritance and legacy. For the sonnets, being outcast is what Shakespeare is doing by publishing them. In the previous episode I discussed how the sonnets would be considered to be more successful the further in time they managed to travel. Cast was also used as cast the dice, which fits with the previous line's fortune. Additionally, it meant a model made from taking an impression of an object, such as a statue, which would connect to the early interpretation of eyes as bronze, and this would be describing the sonnets as they related to Shakespeare. It could also refer to a cast in the eye, which in Shakespeare's day described a slight squint, from an older sense of warp or turn, which relates both to the previous line's eyes as well as Sonnet 28's torture, which meant contort, twist, or distort. State meant condition, physical or emotional, as well as posture or arrangement, which aligns with Cast's reading as a model made from taking an impression of an object. State could possibly also be seen as a verb standing in for a noun to represent the statement or testament that the sonnet sequence forms. I'm not sure why I'm surprised that the word trouble appears only once in the entire sonnet sequence, but it's interesting that aside from to trouble and disturb, it also meant to make cloudy, and operates with deaf heaven to connect us to the clouds that blot the heaven in sonnet 28. Deaf, until the 18th century, was pronounced deaf, and was used to suggest refusing to listen or hear. It's also a good description for the sonnet sequence that does not have ears to hear, or the reader who has ears to hear but can only do so when they read the sonnets out loud. The following is a quote from Shakespeare's Venus and Adonis that I think may be relevant. Had I no eyes but ears, my ears would love, that inward beauty and invisible. Or were I deaf, thy outward parts would move each part in me that were but sensible. Though neither eyes nor ears, to hear nor see, yet should I be in love by touching thee. Bootless may seem like without boots, an oddly but oddly evocative expression here, but in Shakespeare's day meant without advantage or unprofitable, and may still have been remembered for its late Old English meaning of unpardonable, not to be atoned for, without help or remedy. These fit well with the themes of lending and judgment that run throughout the sequence. The general sense of the first quatrain is fairly straightforward, describing Shakespeare or his sonnet's situation when they are not being appreciated, when Shakespeare's son has been taken from him, perhaps along with any respect due his status as a father, with a strong direct reference to Narcissus looking upon his reflection and cursing the heavens for being helplessly and futilely in love. Having said that, the first lines can also be read as, When I have had my grace taken from me, I weep for my outcast state through the eyes of men who are led by chance to read this, who trouble deaf heaven by repeating my songs that will not be able to help me, and who look upon the me that I've embedded in these sonnets and curse my fate on my behalf. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him, like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I most enjoy, contented least. Wishing, once again, is a reference to the well that Narcissus sees his reflection in. 
hope in Middle English was strongly related to wish and desire. Possessed could have been read as possessed of as well as possessed by. Scope meant room to act as well as to view, but in Shakespeare's day was also used as a shortened form of horoscope, which ties into the established astrological theme. Contented recalls the content from the first sonnet, suggesting contentment, but also containing. The second quatrain has a fairly straightforward reading, with Shakespeare or the sonnets wishing to be more like others and being eternally unsatisfied with their lot. The last lines, with what I most enjoy contented least, seems almost antithetical, unless we read it as, I am lacking in what I most enjoy at which point it's difficult to determine whether what the speaker enjoys the most is those things listed previously, hope, good looks, friends, art, and power, or whether it's Shakespeare lamenting the loss of his son, or the sonnet, the loss of Shakespeare's presence. It's also possible that it is not the speaker who is wishing themselves to be more like others, but rather that the readers are wishing that Shakespeare and the sonnets would be more like them, and that they are not pleased by what Shakespeare and his sonnets most enjoy. Yet in these thoughts myself almost despising, happily I think on thee and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. These thoughts refer to what's been described in the previous quatrain, but as I suggested, do not necessarily reflect what Shakespeare or the sonnets are thinking. Despising, as mentioned before, operates with the capitalized fortune to connect this sonnet to sonnet 37. Happily meant by chance. Lark is a fascinating word, because while it's clearly related to Shakespeare's play Cymbeline, when Cloten responds to the sun rising with, Hark, hark, the lark at heaven's gate sings, there is only one mention of the lark in Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses. In Book 8, when Golding informs us that Scylla, daughter of King Nisus, turns into one when her father spies her holding on to King Minos' ship. I've often recommended Golding's translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses to anyone who's interested in any of Shakespeare's works. You can find a link to it in the description. There's a fair amount of this sonnet that lines up with the story of Scylla, so I believe it's safe to say that Sonnet 29 is at least referencing it and possibly even using it in order to frame the disgrace and loneliness. Not being familiar with Cymbeline, though, I must admit I'm intrigued by the relationship of the song that begins with that quoted line and a number of earlier sonnets, so I guess I'm going to have to read through it sooner rather than later. Sullen in Middle English meant unique or singular, and in Old French was lonely. Hymns in the original quarto text was spelled H-I-M-N-S, and it appears that that might be a break from the traditional spelling. If so, then singing hymns very elegantly describes what the sonnets are about, singing Shakespeare's and encouraging the reader to do so as well. Heaven here is capitalized, which suggests the Christian notion of heaven. If the third quatrain speaker is the sonnet, then although the sonnet almost despises itself after the thoughts of the previous quatrain, it thinks of Shakespeare and or the reader, and its state changes from one of loneliness to one of blissfully singing the bard's songs. If it's Shakespeare, his grief and despondency are immediately relieved when he thinks of the reader reading his sonnets, and he recovers a sense of relief and joy that such fantasy provides. It's also possible to read this as the reader thinking of Shakespeare and his sonnet sequence, and rejoicing in the love that's being shared between the three of them. For thy sweet love remembered such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Remembered is one of my favorite words, as it literally means to put the pieces of someone back together, which is what Shakespeare is hoping that the sonnets and the reader will cooperate to achieve for him. Wealth meant well-being and happiness. I cannot help but wonder if Shakespeare wasn't perhaps attempting to inject a play reference here. It does seem like sonnets 29 and 30 might have easily been written by Richard III, with this sonnet's closing couplet describing the wretched king's state of mind as he famously shouted, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. 
kings is capitalized, and with the previously capitalized heaven suggests a biblical reference, either to the Old Testament's book of kings or to the King James Bible. The former makes more sense to me, as the book of kings describes the entire history of the monarchy to its fall, which provides a fantastic sense of the temporary nature of power that the kingdom of Israel enjoyed. If it's a reference to the King James Bible, it might be suggesting that Shakespeare would not trade the love of his sonnet sequence, not even for the Holy Bible. Either way, the intention behind the closing couplet is clear. Shakespeare's love for himself, his son, and his sonnets. The sonnet's love for Shakespeare and the reader. And the reader's love for Shakespeare and the sonnets. These are the true sources of the bard's immortal influence and are all worth far more than fleeting wealth and power, no matter how great. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they have not enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com, Facebook, Minds.com, Twitter, Instagram, or Reddit. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another enough. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? Ever.